this week at NASA. Please give them your applause. They've done an amazing job. Team PipistrelUSA.com of State College, Pennsylvania, flew away with the largest prize in aviation history, $1.35 million, at NASA's Green Flight Challenge in Santa Rosa, California. Both Pipistrel and second place winner Egenius flew their all electric aircraft 200 miles in less than two hours, using just over the equivalent of a half gallon of fuel per passenger. That was twice the fuel efficiency requirement of the competition, conducted by the Comparative Aircraft Fuel Efficiency Foundation and sponsored by Google. It represents the dawn of a new era in efficient flight and is the first time that full-scale electric aircraft have performed in competition. The electricity is not only a viable, but in fact a beautiful way of powering these airplanes. When our airplanes fly overhead 2,000 feet up, we cannot hear them. When they fly by, they are no emissions. The power to recharge our batteries came from a geothermal plant powered by geysers near Santa Rosa. This is absolutely incredible. The technologies demonstrated may end up in general aviation aircraft, spawning new jobs and new industries for the 21st century. This prize competition is part of the NASA Centennial Challenges Program, part of the Space Technology Program, managed by the NASA Office of the Chief Technologist. The three-member Expedition 29 crew of Commander Mike Fossum and flight engineers Satoshi Furukawa and Sergei Volkov continues preparing for the October 29th undocking of the Progress 42 resupply craft from the International Space Station. Its replacement cargo vehicle, Progress 45, is scheduled to arrive at the ISS on November 2nd, carrying two and a half tons of food, fuel, and supplies. Expedition 29 is scheduled to expand to six crew members two weeks later, with the arrival of flight engineers Dan Burbank, Anton Shkoplerov, and Anatoly Ivanishin on November 16th. Fossum, Furukawa, and Volkov are scheduled to return home on November 22nd. New measurements from the Herschel Space Observatory show that Comet Hartley 2, which comes from the distant Kuiper Belt, contains the same kind of water as Earth's oceans. Scientists theorize Earth started out hot and dry, so that water critical for life must have been delivered millions of years later by asteroid and comet impacts. Until now, none of the comets previously studied contained water with the same chemical signature as Earth's. However, Herschel's observations of Hartley 2, the first in-depth look at water in a comet from the Kuiper Belt, may help explain how Earth's surface ended up covered in water. Results from a NASA-led study shows unprecedented depletion of ozone protection in the area above the Arctic. Prolonged, unusually low temperatures in the stratosphere last winter are responsible. The study also shows that ozone destruction in the Arctic this year is comparable to that seen in the Antarctic, where an ozone hole has formed each spring since the mid-1980s. The compliance with the Montreal Protocol has limited and really halted the increase in ozone-destroying substances. Those substances that destroy ozone have very, very long lifetimes of many years. It will be many years in the future before those go down to levels where we don't have a lot of ozone destruction. The ozone layer encircles our planet, extends some 10 to 20 miles above Earth's surface, and shields us from much of the harmful ultraviolet radiation that comes from the sun. And now, centerpieces. It's arguably one of the most prestigious awards that can be given to a scientist, the Nobel Prize for Physics. People have mentioned that this is the kind of thing that could win the Nobel Prize, but somehow I couldn't actually picture that happening. Dr. Adam Reese from Baltimore, Maryland Space Telescope Science Institute is now the latest in this long line of notable recipients. His work, along with two others, changed our view of the universe. How it's not only getting larger, but it's doing so at a faster and faster rate. We learn that we don't really understand gravity, that basic phenomenon that you take a ball, you throw it up in the air, it's supposed to fall back down. In this case, it went back up. Reese's research used NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and other observatories to make this cosmos-shattering discovery 
that there's a different force at work, a mystery still being unraveled, called dark energy. The fact they've kept this telescope going for 20 years meant that, that Adam was able to track the history of the universe using the successive upgrades from one servicing mission to the next. That's why we have the Nobel Prize. Adam Reese's and his team's Nobel Prize you know, validated you know, my feelings that it's worth risking our lives to put in these great scientific instruments on Hubble. But even with the Nobel Prize under his belt, Reese says there is still much more to learn. Hopefully use new space telescopes, maybe the James Webb Space Telescope, the new survey telescope from the Decadal Survey, and using these together, we hope to learn more about the nature of dark energy. And it's that nature that will keep scientists like Reese looking to the edge of the universe. A new Space Act agreement revives a commitment to economic development aimed at supporting NASA's current and future missions. Kennedy's Space Center Director, Robert Cabana, and Linda Weatherman, President and CEO of the Economic Development Commission of Florida's Space Coast, signed the new Five-Year Space Act Agreement October 3rd at Kennedy. The new agreement highlights a continuing partnership that also benefits KSC's surrounding communities. Uh, we've had a great partnership over the years and I think working together to bring uh, jobs and the right kind of work here to uh, the Space Coast is really important. The two agencies will explore new opportunities and space-related economic development in the future. Visitors to the Virginia Air and Space Center in Hampton on a recent Friday night were greeted by an ice sculpture, a stunning crystalline likeness of a space shuttle. The occasion? a special celebration to honor NASA Langley Research Center's role in the Space Shuttle Program. Holy cow, as far as I can see, there are people. That is wonderful. Many in the crowd of more than 600 had contributed to the shuttle's success. Those contributions started early, more than 10 years before the first orbiter flew in 1981. America's first space shuttle. In fact, Langley Research helped determine exactly what the shuttle would look like. Langley staff, quickly determined the straight wing orbiter mm -mm, wouldn't fly. So began more than a dozen years of testing here at Langley, over 60,000 hours of testing and over a dozen of your wind tunnels to be exact. NASA Administrator and four-time shuttle astronaut Charles Bolden was an honored guest and speaker at the celebration. He commanded two missions. So did one of the other speakers, Chris Ferguson. Ferguson was the commander of Atlantis for STS-135, the shuttle's last flight. For that, uh, I am ever going to be uh, eternally proud to represent you and for your role in what you've done over the course of the last uh, uh, 30 years uh, to, to pull the space shuttle program together and keep it running and supported. Uh, you should be enormously proud. Also proud and surprised was Robbie Kearns, Langley's space shuttle operations liaison. He was presented with a special flight awareness award. Hi, my name is Eric Aguilar and I'm the uh, System Integration and Test Lead for the Mars Science Laboratory project here at uh, JPL. I've worked on uh, three different flight missions, MER, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, Dawn, and uh, now uh, MSL with uh, Curiosity. So one of the things we may do is we may actually simulate a launch scenario, a run through the crew scenarios, run through entry, descent and landing, and of course surface operations. We work through all various uh, portions of the mission phase and we do all the testing for that within the software and the hardware. We make sure everything interacts and, and works uh, properly. Went to school at uh, Arizona State University. I uh, received my bachelor's in electrical engineering. Take the time to enjoy where you're at. You know, in other words, uh, live in the moment that you're in. In high school, you know, don't take it too serious. I mean, obviously, get serious, you know, get good grades. You want to get into college, but enjoy it. Large fires burning throughout Australia. Dust plumes over the Mediterranean Sea. Both have been captured by NASA's busy moderate resolution imaging spectroradiometers. The MODIS aboard NASA's Aqua satellite took this image of fires raging through thick grass in remote areas of northern and central Australia. Fires have burned through nearly 58,000 square miles of land. 
in what's proving to be one of Australia's most extreme fire seasons in years. From aboard NASA's Terra satellite, its MODIS has produced this picture of dust plumes in the eastern Mediterranean, ringing the island of Cyprus. The dust extends far enough to reach the southern shores of Turkey and parts of Syria. 37 teachers from across the country recently participated in two three-day workshops in Palmdale, California, as part of NASA's Airborne Research Experiences for Educators program, ARIES. The program targets sixth through ninth grade educators of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as well as college students currently enrolled in an accredited teacher credentialing curriculum. They worked with and heard from NASA engineers and a scientist involved in airborne science and flight research. It's a black and white image saying how bright it is at this frequency band. Just, it's just black and white image saying it's bright here, not bright here. The groups also toured NASA science aircraft, including the Sophia Airborne Observatory at the Dryden Aircraft Operations Facility, and participated in an innovative teacher-student challenge to plan a flight mission to improve earthquake monitoring. The events were sponsored in part by Dryden Flight Research Center's Office of Education and the Teaching from Space program at the Johnson Space Center. Yeah, let's go in that little area place. We gotta find it. This unique corn maze in Lathrop, California, is one of seven at so-called space farms across the country, honoring NASA and the 50th anniversary of human spaceflight. The Central Valley in California is not near any NASA center. Um, and so being able to outreach here in kind of a non-traditional way to non-traditional communities is really important to us. Operated by the Del Osso family and sponsored by NASA, this 20-acre maze features the discoveries and images of the agency's Kepler mission. Kepler is the first spacecraft capable of finding Earth-sized planets in or near the habitable zone, the region in a planetary system believed suitable to support life as we know it. Visitors also had access to an aerial ropes course, zip lines, rides, and more. The Space Farm 7 Maze Project combines the thrill of space with the intrigue of finding your way out of a maze. This is a Brazilian feed corn. It grows about 10 feet tall, and we plant the maize. We just do one solid planting and carve it out when the corn is really small. Some people wonder if we take the stalks out when they're 10 feet, which is obviously not going to happen because that'd be very, very difficult. And then when we're done for the season, we plow it under and we feed it to cattle. Each farm selected a theme highlighting that region's particular NASA field center and its contribution to the agency. You can vote for your favorite NASA-themed maze design at www.spaceform7.com. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, log on to www.nasa.gov.